Welcome to Pottery Visited, episode 50. I'm Tori. And I'm Shay. And today we are jumping into chapter 13 of Prisoner of Azkaban, Gryffindor versus Ravenclaw. Or, as we like to call it, Broom Go Vroom. Well, first of all, I can't believe we've done 50 episodes. 50 episodes is crazy. When, when I got, went on my trip to Salem, our tour guide, who was amazing, mentioned afterwards that he has a podcast on Salem. And all I could think when he said he's a podcast was like, I hope I have more episodes. Yeah, started a little COVID project and here we are. Here we are. So this is like our uh, first like kind of big Quidditch chapter, which is fun to get back to since the other Quidditch chapter earlier on was more about Dementors and bad things happening for the plot. To infer the words of Oliver Wood, thank you for getting done with the plot so we can focus on the Quidditch. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he appreciates it. So we open up this chapter with the kind of the fallout between Ron and Hermione and, uh, from the last chapter where Ron is very angry with Hermione because he believes Crookshanks has eaten scabbers and Hermione never took the issue seriously and she wouldn't apologize and he's very upset about it. I mean, look, I'm a true crime girly. So the victim is missing, that being scabbards. So there's evidence of someone who has a history of violence towards the missing victim in the form of fur and blood at the scene of the crime. So I would say Ron is fairly justified in assuming that Crookshanks was involved in the tragic missing case of Scabbers the Rat. And uh, I think given Hermione's history of not taking his complaints seriously, I feel like in this case, he's fairly justified in his anger. Yeah, I definitely think this has been a long time coming and this is what Ron was worried about the whole book. And it's basically for what we know has happened. And I do think that his anger is justified, but I'm wondering why Hermione doubles down on uh, Crookshanks being innocent so much like I feel like she's a logical person and I feel like with all the evidence the natural conclusion would be like okay this did happen and I think all really Ron really wants is her to apologize and know that she's sorry for it happening yeah you're right Ron I should have been paying more attention to my cat it was neglectful of me not to I should have been more conscientious about your feelings and your pet safety my bad I'll help you look for him is probably what she should have done I think it's partially Hermione hates being wrong and she assumed her cat would never actually eat scabbers. But I think it's a little bit like being correct and being the one who's more conscientious about things is such a core part of who Hermione is. I don't think she's really able to deal with the cognitive dissonance of realizing something bad happened because she was the negligent one, because she didn't contemplate the negative outcomes. Like that's what she does. She's the one who's like, actually, the broom could be dangerous. Let's check it out. Actually, this could end badly. Let's think about it. And this is the first time where like, she wasn't the one saying this could be dangerous. Let's try and prevent it. She just let it happen. And so it's such a like core part of who she is is that is in question in the circumstance she just like can't handle that cognitive dissonance she's like no i would never i definitely think she's also i think she's losing her kind of grasp on reality at this point too because she's doing all these classes and she's kind of worn to her last thread and i don't think she can handle something going wrong yeah something being her fault because she's so like overwhelmed with school and the time turn and that she's just like she can't deal with it so she's just not going to acknowledge it there are definitely negative psychological repercussions to free Frequent time travel. Yep. And negative psychological repercussions to just taking on a workload that's way too much. So Harry tries to like tell her mind, like, you know, it kind of like seems like Scabbers was eaten by Crookshanks. Just look at the evidence, Hermione, like the evidence says. <laughs> He's just trying to be like, you know, do the right thing and apologize. And Hermione kind of loses her temper at Harry, which I think is the kind of a sign the pressure's kind of getting to her. Because I do feel like I get the idea of hurt feelings because Hermione's already gotten to a fight with Harry and Ron already and so she kind of sees their sides and Harry's taking Ron's side and she's like I knew you would do this so she already feels like their friendship's kind of like not where it was and she feels like less than Ron and so she just doesn't want to like deal with getting hurt again and losing the friendship so she's just not even gonna acknowledge Harry she's like you chose Ron's side and so I'm done with you too. <laughs> He's like, I didn't choose Ron's side. I chose Scabber's side. It's different. <laughs> but uh, Ron's uh, really taking the loss of Scabber's really hard. And uh, even Fred and George are kind of like, you didn't really care about Scabber's. You said he was boring. And they're trying to like, you know, cheer him up. But Ron's just like, he's just very upset about it. And I'm wondering kind of like, why does he take it so hard? I mean, even if he doesn't like his rat, he loves his rat. You know, I feel like 
Scabbers was something that was his, something that was a part of his life for a long time. Yeah. It's something that Ron had that was reliable and it's always there. When something that's a part of your life for a long time goes away, even if it's not your favorite thing, there's certainly an absence in your life. And it was a living thing. You know, maybe he didn't have fun with Scabbers, but Scabbers existed and had his own. Yeah, he's just there. He brings up the time where the Scabbers bit Goyle's finger back in book one. Yeah, respectable. Respectable. I definitely think it's also because Ron doesn't have a lot of things that are just his. And even though he inherited Scabbers from Percy, it was still like his thing. Yeah. Things matter more when you have less of them, I think. It's easier to to appreciate and value them more when it's not like, I'll just get a new one. Yeah. Because yeah, even Fred and George were like, go get a new rat from Hogsmeade. And he's just like, no, I wanted that rat. That was my rat. That was my annoyed, tired, sickly rat. And I want it back. Well, despite the loss of uh, Scabbers, everyone is very excited about Harry's Firebolt. I mean, who wouldn't be? Boom, broom go vroom. Yeah, everyone's like going nuts over it. Even Madame Hooch, they come down for the practice and the team's all excited about it, especially Oliver. Oliver is just like living his life, feeling great. And it's like, it's so beautiful. Don't look at it too long. <laughs> And even Madame Hooch is like holding on to it and she's going over like how amazing it is. And they're like, uh, can we get the broom back so we can start practice? She's just fangirling. They're all fangirling over Harry's fancy new toy. Yeah. And they say it's like the best practice ever because the fireball's just amazing. And everyone's just like, we're going to win. The broom really carries the team. <laughs> uh, one of the things the twins say, Fred specifically, when they're talking about if Dementors will show up or not. Fred's like, nah, the Dementors won't show up again. Dumbledore would do his nut if Dementors showed up. And I gotta know what do his nut is. Is it one of those Britishisms? I feel like that's, yeah, I feel it must be a British saying. Like that just means go nuts? Because <laughs> it sounds super inappropriate. To, he's gonna do his nut. It's one of those things I feel like it must be a Britishism. And you just, I read things and I don't think I really picked them up as a kid because I'm just like reading. And if I didn't really understand things, I was just like, whatever. Yeah. But it's one of those things that you, you read it and your brain's like, okay, yeah, if he does, so he doesn't freak out. And then you say, wait, what were the actual individual words I read? And you go back and you're like, sorry, what? Yeah, I feel like it must be a Britishism. We've had, I would hope. We have a lot of uh, British downloads. So if anyone would like to correct us of what this phrase is, <laughs> let, it, let us know. Yeah, because it sounds awful. Just really bad. <laughs> so Oliver mentions to Harry that the seeker for Ravenclaw is going to be Cho Chang, which is like our first introduction to her as she'll play a bigger part in the series down the line, for Harry at least. Yeah. And I know we're, we're going to talk about brooms a bit later, but um, I just think it's not really fair to the other students that Harry has this basically professional level broom. Yeah. Because they're talking about like just like how amazing it is and like Harry's just like f zooming around there, like flying past everyone and yeah, it doesn't seem very fair. It doesn't. No, we'll get into that later because uh, I have a lot of concerns about it. <laughs> I mean, it's cool and fun and stuff, but in competition, I have concerns. Um, so they have the best practice ever because of the firebolt, naturally. It carries the team, like I said. And then on the way back, they see Crookshanks. And at first, Harry thinks it's the Grimm, but it's just Crookshanks. So that's a little bit relieving. But then afterwards, to avoid seeing any more eyes in the darkness, Harry just like doesn't look to the side. He just like looks forward and doesn't like let his eyes wander and that's such a like hilarious way of handling it like i might see this dangerous thing that signifies death i can't prevent it from happening but i can prevent me from seeing it i choose blissful ignorance <laughs> yeah we always joke about divination but there's a valid option of like finding divination things to be true but also not wanting to know them that is like it's very valid to believe in fortune telling in the future but not wanting to know it <laughs> Like, that's fair. I think a lot of it is like, if you believe in it, then it's real. If you don't believe in it, then it's not real. And I feel like Harry is kind of believing in it right now. Yeah. He's like, I don't believe Trelawney, but I do think if I see a dog, I'll die. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the next morning, they are getting ready for their Quidditch game. And Harry, like, goes down to the Great Hall of, like, boys from the dormitory. The squad. To protect the fireballs. <laughs> and then Wood makes a place on the table for it. Like, it's like a third, like, a, I guess, like eighth member of the team yeah the best team true team captain the broom and everyone's coming up to see it and even percy's like really excited about it and he made a bet with uh, his girlfriend about the winner of the match and he, he's like harry you gotta win because i don't have 10 galleons so even percy's getting into it 
That's such a Fred and George thing to do. We'll bet money we don't have. I can't believe Percy did such a thing. Well, I feel like but because Harry has the firebolt and it's just so amazing, even Percy's like getting into it. Yeah. So he even so it just kind of shows like how crazy the firebolt is. Like everyone's just like so obsessed and like, yeah, really pumped up for the match. It's like a it's like a museum piece. They're like, ooh, to see one in real life. How exciting. Yeah. At the match, Harry sees Cho Chang for the first time, and he notices that she's very pretty. He's like, ooh, a lady. <laughs> and it's kind of thinking to me that th- I think this is the first time Harry's really noticed a girl like in that kind of way. That we know of, yeah, for sure. I don't think they've... But again, it makes sense with the maturity level. Like, he's 13. Seems like a reasonable age for a boy to realize that. Yeah, so he notices that she's pretty, and then he has kind of like this tightening in his stomach that he doesn't know what it's about so he kind of has the butterflies in his stomach seeing her for the first time so hormones harry's kind of like first crush he's becoming (laughs) a teenager repulsive (laughs) but uh lee jordan's back to commentary which is amazing i love lee jordan's commentary it's such a nice like speckling of flavor it's i mean it's color commentary he's not announcing he's giving color commentary and it's so much better And I feel like we don't get enough of it in the films because he's so funny. And like with this, it's just the firebolt. Well, in the films, you can see it. So in the book, his commentary works to tell you what's happening and break up like the action. Yeah. And then have dialogue to kind of intersect it. That just it makes it more fun. It's not just really driving like Harry zooms right, Cho zooms left. And it's just very much like. Yeah. Yeah. In the film, you can see the Quidditch game happening. But just the flavor, the ridiculous things he says, the insults to the other teams, the blatant show of affection for the brew <laughs> yeah so lee jordan is just basically doing an advertisement for the firebolt and mcconnell keeps telling him off yeah this game is brought to you by the firebolt buy one today favorite thing is um harry's obviously noticed cho so he's being kind of like he's still playing but he's not being like as aggressive and wood yells at him don't be a gentleman yeah harry's so like he's so caught off guard by being against a pretty lady that he's kind of like oh i couldn't knock her off her broom that would be rude which i mean hey it's you know it's co-ed sports so it's respectful to knock her off your, her broom if you would have knocked her male counterpart off his broom. So, you know, knock her off her broom. We kind of see in this chapter, like, how crazy the firebolt is compared to, like, everyone else's broom. Ridiculous. It's ridiculous. But uh, Harry um, and Cho see what looks like to be a Dementor down by the stands. And Harry kind of, like, sends it up Patronus. And he says something leaves. So I'm assuming it's some kind of Patronus. It's not corporeal yet. Yeah. But it's still very impressive because there's a lot going on in this Quidditch game. And Harry's just able to like not even really think, just take out his wand, cast the spell, and then just get back to the game, which I think is... Yeah, he sees it, thinks probably Dementor, points, shoots, Quidditches. Like... Yeah, it's amazing. Super advanced magic. Especially because this spell is like a lo- very advanced for Harry, and he's just able to do that without really like having to concentrate or anything. He's just like, okay, shoot back to the game. Good. It was perfect. It's exactly what everyone could have wanted from him. And I'm sure Oliver Wood is like, so happy. I mean, everyone's happy. Lupin's proud, blah, 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 blah. But Oliver Wood is like, yes. Yes. (laughs) I think it's funny that like, once it's revealed that like, it wasn't real Dementors, it was Draco. And like, Harry doesn't even experience the like anger he would feel about like Draco pulled a trick on him. Draco tried to ruin the game. Draco tricked him into thinking there was a Dementor because he just feels such a sense of smugness and joy at Draco being publicly in trouble. Like he's just so satisfied by Draco losing those house points and looking like an idiot. Yeah. And it's also like he, they won the game as well. So he's very happy that he won because that means they're really close to winning the, the cup. Even like Wood yells, that's my boy when he, he catches the snitch and all all the girls kiss him on the cheek and friend George are like hugging him so tight and Ron's coming out with all the boys and they're like cheering him and all happy. So not even Malfoy can like read on Harry's parade. He not only won the game, he not only succeeded at not being distracted by the distraction, he didn't advance spell in front of everybody. And Draco looks like an idiot. It's just like a good overall time for Harry Potter. And Draco looks like such an idiot. Yeah, Draco got quite a dressing down from McGonagall, which is so funny. <laughs> I do think, especially considering how seriously they take Quidditch at the school and like the rules of Quidditch and safety precautions and stuff, I think that the punishment should have been more severe for Draco, Crab, and Goyle. Like they lost some house points and they're going to have detention. But keeping in mind that like the 
and the outcome of this game implicates Slytherin standings in the Quidditch tournament as well. It's like not just a mean prank. It's also like sabotage. And I kind of think they should have kicked Draco off of the Slytherin team immediately for doing this. Like you cannot interfere in a game you are not playing. I got to go called over Dumbledore and not Snape, which makes me think that there's probably going to be like more severe punishments like actual repercussions maybe running home to their families and stuff because usually where for punishments you would tell the head of house like i'm giving them detention and stuff but she's like i'm gonna tell dumbledore about this because it's like more serious to her at least mcgonagall takes quidditch very seriously i mean it should be i really think he should be removed from the team for this, at least for the rest of the year, if not for the rest of his time at Hogwarts, because like, you can't do that. Like, that's just not an option. I also think, and this is sort of an aside, but Madam Hooch sees Harry catching that snitch and blows the whistle, game over, Gryffindor wins, from like, so far away. Like, he's up past the clouds. He's really high up. It's a very small snitch. She also needs to keep an eye on the goalposts. Like, does she have special eyes? <laughs> or is she using like magical binoculars? Like, how is she seeing this? I feel like she's described having like eagle eyes, but yeah, I don't know how refs do it for Quidditch. They describe her eyes as a special color too. I believe they're they're yellow like a cat, which is cool and awesome. And I love that for her. So like maybe she does have special eyes. I don't know if that's a spell or just like a hereditary thing. Yeah, it feels weird that Quidditch only has one ref because I feel like there's so many parts of the game that are being played that you would need like two or three just to like one person keeps an eye on the chasers. The other one keeps an eye on like the seekers and one's just like an overall person looking for fouls especially because the refs miss a lot of like fouls and stuff in quidditch we hear them being noticed and not called and like even hockey has two refs and two linesmen like that's like four sets of eyes keeping an eye on things plus they've got it recorded so they can do instant replay yeah there's only kind of like one main play of hockey is the puck and quidditch there's like three different games being played so it feels a little bit like they should have more refs in quidditch for sure and and she like kind of stays near the ground like there should be one really high up i don't know it's it's not the best method but clearly she has special eyes and i love that for her fred and george announced they're gonna throw a party at the gryffindor common room and they obviously go to hogsmeade and get a bunch of stuff because the girls ask them like how did you get this and they're like oh thanks to mooney padfoot and prongs or wormtail they mention him but they don't mean it <laughs> <laughs> yeah but the, it doesn't matter which is like fun and everyone's having a great time, but Harry sees that Hermione's just like in the corner reading a book. Yeah, classic Hermione. Not really participating. And when he comes over being like, did you even go to the match? And she's kind of like borderline hysterical. Yeah. <laughs> like she's talking in a really high voice and she's like, I gotta finish this for tomorrow. And Ron doesn't even want me here. And she's just kind of like losing her marbles a little bit. When I am super anxious and very overwhelmed, I think I talk in that way. Like I get higher and I'm like, okay, I just have to get this done and this done before we can do this or else this is going to get done. Like that's exactly how I am. So I can feel it. I think it's also hard being in a place where you know someone doesn't want you there. Like she's in a fight with Ron and Ron's like obviously part of the party and stuff and she can see him there and she knows that he does they're in a fight and like the idea of just like having to like be somewhere where you know you're not really wanted yeah it's it's a lot yeah she's dealing with a lot right now and she's very anxious and she's underslept under medicated over schooled <laughs> she's probably been awake for like 36 hours with the time turner stuff and doesn't know how many hours she's been awake because time has no meaning to her anymore, actually. Actually, it's pretty impressive that Hermione's still, like, mentally still there. Because I feel like if I was doing a time turner, I would be, like, two days, I would be, like... Yeah, it's weird that she hasn't, like, stabbed someone. <laughs> if I don't get enough sleep, I am not a good person. Yeah, honestly, I think I was someone would have come over and been like, can I borrow a quill? And I'd stab them in the hand or something. I would be absolutely on edge, erratic, unpredictable. It'd be a disaster. Yeah, so just when Hermione tells Harry that Ron doesn't really want her at the party, Ron's pretty mean and he makes this whole announcement about like, oh, Scabbers would have loved this party and this food here. This candy was his favorite. Yeah, and so Hermione cries and she runs away and Ron doesn't really seem too, too torn up about it. And even Harry's just kind of like, can you cut her a break? Which I get like, poor Harry's always like in the middle of his friends. Yeah. And I've been in, I think everyone's been in that situation if you're in the middle of two friends that have a falling out. 
And it's really difficult because you want everything to be back to normal and you want things to be easier for you. Yeah. But you still want to be friends with both of them. And yeah, it's a really hard place to be in. But Ron is very clear that he wants an apology. He wants her to know that her to know that she feels bad about what happened and he feels that she doesn't and that she will admit she's wrong and that that's the Ron's whole thing which it, it makes sense he's just trying to feel that way I think he's also being even meaner about it because it's prolonged like I think he would have forgiven her if she had apologized properly and still been sad about it but not had been so sort of cruel about it but now like his pain is being prolonged because he's not getting his apology so he's building up this like anger and yeah he's a bit vindictive being mean yeah before it was like he wanted an apology because he's sad and now he's kind of like there's a part of him that probably a little bit wants to hurt Hermione I think yeah I think he wants to see that she feels bad and I think like when she ended up like, apologizing when she's crying and stuff he's kind of alarmed by it because it's a lot of emotions and Ron's not really emotionally mature at this point but like he definitely like he just wanted to know that she felt bad and Hermione does but she just can't like admit that or like really show that vulnerability at this point and I think it really takes, like, Hagrid losing his case and, like, all this bad stuff happening for her to really kind of break down. Yeah. But McGonagall comes and shuts down the party at 1 a.m. Should go to bed, assholes! <laughs> <laughs> so they all go to bed, and Harry has this really interesting dream. I really like Harry's dreams, where they're not about Voldemort. They're not Voldemort dreams. They're just his dreams. Yeah. And so Harry has this dream about seeing some kind of Patronus that's, like, galloping, and he's trying to catch it, and he's running, he's running towards it. And we know that... Harry Patronus is a stag, and his dad was form was a stag. So I feel like this is like him running towards his dad or something. Because we talked about last episode that this is a really big like uh, James Harry kind of book. Yeah, daddy issues. Oh, I'm just wondering if maybe James is trying to convey something to him, or he's just Harry's like you know just looking for his dad, he wants to know more about his dad. In my mind, it's about the symbology of fatherhood more than his actual particular father. So I sort of see it as like a subconscious level of trying to seek out father figures because that's sort of how this book is. Like, Hagrid, are you my father? Lupin, will you be my father? Serious, will you be? You know what I mean? I think in my mind, when I heard that dream, I think it's Harry's chase to find, to fill that void with some sort of older paternal figure. And the Patronus is just a, a light, comforting way of embodying that and his dreams interrupted because ron starts screaming and he says sirius black had a knife and was trying to kill him and his friends are like yeah okay ron go back to bed yeah but then they they see that his his hangings like uh, on his bed are all slashed up and they run down to the common room and they didn't see him but i'm just thinking like obviously sirius did break in we found that out at the end yeah I feel like, what was Sirius thinking going into the dorm room with a knife? Just like, you know, just scaring the living daylights out of some kids? Yeah, mm-hmm. That's what I call Gryffindor logic. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, he's kind of lost it. But um, just in what way was this a good plan? I mean, in his mind, he's like, oh, I know there's a bad guy in that common room. I'll go up there. I'll kill the bad guy and save the day. Because, like, that's Gryffindor logic. It's like, yeah, the plan is to succeed and celebrate. <laughs> like, that's the Gryffindor logic. There's no, like, but what if it doesn't? What if I get caught? What if they don't immediately see me with a knife and think, look at this hero come to save the day? <laughs> yeah, I'm just thinking of, like, the terror on I almost felt like just being woken up by some guy over your bed with a knife. Yeah, I think I would have 100% peed Jesus. myself. <laughs> yeah, I think Ron, Ron kind of handled it pretty well, being th that scared. He wasn't in shock or anything. Like, he screamed, and then he was just very much like, Sirius Black was here. And he tells Percy, and, like, I think if anyone else, they would have been just, like, petrified. See, yeah, I feel like for me, like, I often have dreams that are very vivid, and sometimes I, I enact them in my sleep once I punched my favorite water glass onto the floor and broke it because in my dream I was punching a zombie. <laughs> and um, so I feel like there's a chance I would have punched Sirius in the face. <laughs> there's a chance. Yeah, so uh, I just think... Um... We find out from Professor McGonagall coming in and kind of they question Sir Cardogan and it turns out he did let uh, Sirius Black in because he had all the passwords. And we, had, we talked about this uh, last episode, but they really should have had better security. Like they knew Sir Cardogan was kind of not a great guardian for the tower, so they should have had other methods like you talked about last episode to kind of uh, make it more secure. Because obviously this is a huge breach. Yeah. And the problem isn't 
isn't even with Neville because everyone knew he forgot the passwords. The the problem is with the adults who knew what Neville's habits were, knew he couldn't remember the passwords on his own, and didn't step in to find a solution. They waited until the worst case scenario outcome, and now everyone's blaming Neville. But the kid is 13 years old. Someone like a prefect or a teacher should have resolved his password issues before this happened. It's the teacher's fault entirely. And Neville is just trying to be proactive. Yeah. He's trying to be a good a good student because he didn't want to bug people about all the password changes that he couldn't remember. So instead of bugging prefects and other students, he's like, I'm going to write these down so I, I don't have to bother anyone else. You know, take initiative. And of course, he ended up losing the piece of paper they were on. But like, there shouldn't have been, there, like you said, there should have been other ways to protect the tower that weren't Sir Corrigan because obviously he was useless. And also, Sir Corrigan saw the a grown adult man and let him in and was like, yep, I let him in. He had the password. There should have been more information given to Sir Cadogan besides if someone has a password, let them in. Like the only adults who are allowed in here are McGonagall, Dumbledore, whatever. You know what I mean? Like that should have been a thing. And also specifically, if you look like this man, hold up a picture of Sirius, don't let it, like he wasn't using Polyjuice Potion because Ron saw his face and was like, that's Sirius Black from the Wanted posters. So like the man wasn't even using Polyjuice Potion. They should have just held up Kadogan, Kadogan, should have held up the dude's face to him and been like, this is Sirius Black, never let this man in. Period. Doesn't know if, matter if he knows the password. They should have had Peeves in charge of the, the tower. He's the one that yelled yelled like crazy when there was when the fat lady was attacked. Yeah, honestly. I mean Peeves wouldn't want to help anyone out, but like he's a lot more efficient and helpful than this idiot. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, but we end this the, kind of the chapter off in that kind of cliffhanger and just poor Neville getting in trouble. Poor Neville. But going back to uh some broom discussion. Broom talk. I think I take a lot of issue with how much the Firebolt is clearly superior to all the other brooms in the game. Like, they talk about how Cho Chang stands no chance against Harry because of their brooms, him having the Firebolt and her having the Comet. And I feel like if the quality of your equipment changes the quality, like the outcome of the game that much, it kind of dilutes the sanctity of the sport. Like, it feels like in sport, it should be the skill of the players that determines the outcome. But in this, it feels like it, it's almost more on the quality of the room. <laughs> like the skills that they have as players should determine the outcome. But in this, it kind of feels like even if Cho Chang saw the snitch first and started going towards it before Harry, as soon as he saw her going, he could still speed past her and get there. And I just feel like that's really unfair. And like in lower levels of sports, like Little League or Timbits Hockey and stuff, I understand like having newer skates and a better stick is always going to be an existing advantage. But I feel like considering how competitive Quidditch is at Hogwarts and the fact that the school has a lot of money, it seems like to keep the game fair, the brooms should be regulated. Yeah, definitely. Like there should be a rule like you could only use broom models between this model of like Comet 2007 to Nimbus 2003 brooms are the only acceptable range of brooms to keep the game fair. Or in an even more fair option, the school could offer brooms to the team. Like these are the school brooms that the team uses every couple of years. Maybe they update them because Hogwarts obviously has loads of money and can do that. Or everyone's on an equally slow broom and it's still fine because it's even. Or really, like a lot of sports teams do, have a sponsor how beneficial would it be to the broom company to have their brooms be the official brooms used by the entire Hogwarts school student Quidditch teams? Like, that's good promotion. When the students want their own brooms for practicing at home, they'll probably buy that broom because it's the one they'll play at school. The kids who want to learn to play Quidditch will want to learn to play on the broom they'll play at school. Like, it's a really good promotional method. They could just donate brooms every three years to the school for the Quidditch teams because this whole Harry has the fastest broom ever, it kind of feels like a car race and he's in a Maserati and everyone else is on bicycles. And like... <laughs> <laughs> That's just not a measure of skill. Yeah, definitely. I'm just saying it feels super unfair. And also then you can do things like buy your way onto the team like Draco did. He got onto the Slytherin Quidditch team because he got everyone better brooms. And that means kids are going to try out for Quidditch teams who are better than kids who make the team. But because that kid has a better broom, he'll achieve more in the game. Like it just seems unfair. It's a kid's book. Let the kids all have a chance. <laughs> Yeah, just saying that, that they describe the Firebolt as being like a professional level broom. Like this is what the professional Quidditch players are playing on, which feels like not really fair to just give to kids playing on like an inter-house kind of inter-school tournament. Yeah, it's a huge advantage that is not skill or practice based. 
It's like money based and that's rough. I'm trying to think of like other sports where this would like kind of affect it, like sports that have like are based on equipment. I mean, like the, 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 the sharpness of your skates and how new and comfortable they are will obviously impact like how you play hockey or whatever. But like it wouldn't be to this level. Yeah, this is like someone puts like jet propellers on the back of their hockey skates so they can get across the ice faster like it's the only thing i can think of is like racing cars and stuff but i'm pretty sure those are all kind of exactly like... yeah maserati versus bicycle yeah but they're usually i feel in those races they're all pretty even yeah they're all fancy fast cars everything's pretty regulated you can't have fire shooting out the back of your car that's against the rules yeah i mean hogwarts is really weird because like harry was bought a broomstick for like no reason. <laughs> yeah. Harry, who could afford his own broomstick? And they bought him a good one. Yeah. So I feel like there's not a lot of regulation for uh, Quidditch, but also just Quidditch at Hogwarts. It feels like there's, they just do whatever they want. It's anarchy. It's absolute anarchy. Yeah. It kind of seems like it should be regulated. There should be a certain type of broom that's just too advanced for them, too good, not fair to the game. And a kind of broom that's too bad and is like cycled out and they get newer brooms once it becomes a certain age or something. That seems fair. Yeah, it feels kind of kind of classist that they have to buy their own equipment because like families like the Weasleys that have all these kids that play Quidditch, like they're not on good brooms, but families like the Malfoys can just buy whatever. And it, it's definitely not fair because, yeah, like you said, it should be based on their skill and not like what equipment they can buy. I know that's kind of fantastical of me because I know in real life not all people have the same resources and not everyone has the best equipment, but I feel like Hogwarts can afford it. Or even like newest brooms on the team should belong to the seeker because that's the job that needs to be the fastest and like have the slower older brooms be like for the beaters who don't necessarily need to go as fast. I don't know. Like if Harry's on a firebolt, there's no way an opposition team seeker should be on a comet. No offense to comet makers i'm sure they were once a very fine broom yeah it just that feels like it kind of messes with the playing field so like Gryffindor got way too big of an advantage <laughs> yeah i just like i get that it's fun and exciting and harry can totally have whatever broom he wants but what he uses in play especially in like a playoff game yeah i think that's my main broom point is that uh to protect the sanctity of the sport there should be a similar style and quality of equipment given to everyone playing yeah yeah i definitely agree so do you have any other closing uh, remarks for this chapter? Um, I had a great time in Salem. I recommend everyone go and visit. It's very informative. All kinds of neat chaps and things. Everything smells really good. <laughs> <laughs> I should post some of your pictures up on our Instagram. I had an excellent cocktail. It was called the uh, Salem Witch, and it was delicious. Any remarks on the actual chapter of the book? <laughs> yeah, sports. <laughs> Just sports. Yes, part. Yeah, just, you know, Lee Jordan's commentary is top notch. And that's probably the only reason I really like Quidditch chapters because I'm not a sports person. Don't really care about sports commentary, but Lee Jordan and his remarks, they're worth it. All right. Thank you for listening. If you liked this podcast, listen to all our other episodes of this podcast. If you really like this podcast, you can like it on your social medias, such as Twitter. That's what we're calling it, Twitter. That's what it'll be forever. We're not calling it anything else. Um, or Facebook or YouTube. I don't, can you like things on Spotify? I, w- I think you should if you can. Uh, feel free to leave a comment telling us you think our podcast is dumb or you think our podcast is not dumb. <laughs> Those are the options. Yeah, you can follow us on social media at Pottery Visited or email us at PotteryVisitedPodcast at gmail.com. And we'll be back to jump into chapter 14, Snape's Grudge. Bye! <laughs>